Uh, okay, so uh, welcome uh, everyone for this uh, colloquium that uh, uh, we're going to have today with the presence of uh, Professor uh, Timothy Yule from the University of Arizona. Uh, is part of the celebrations that uh, we are having uh, to commemorate the 80th anniversary of uh, the existence of the Instituto de Física and uh, that have been uh, promoted and coordinated by, by uh, the direction of the Institute. Uh, Professor uh, Jul uh, comes from one of the uh, most prestigious laboratories in AMS in the world. This is one of the three laboratories that uh, participated in the uh, dating of the um, uh, Turin uh, Shroud, which is, I think, the beginning of the uh, uh, now uh, common uh, technique of uh, carbon-14 dating. Uh, we've had in the, in the past the, the visit of uh, Professor Douglas Donahue, who was the leader of that laboratory together with, with Tim Yule, who follow up. He's been the editor of the most important uh, uh, journal in, in the field, which is Radiocarbon, and uh, he has a very extensive curriculum that I'm not going to try to uh, summarize for you, uh, and instead I, I, I'd like to ask uh, Tim to, to come and tell us about uh, a brief history of the radiocarbon dating and accelerator mass spectrometry. Uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I really enjoyed the visit in UNAM, and uh, some of my colleagues from Arizona visited uh, here before, and they always make very positive things about uh, UNAM. So the idea of this talk originally was to give a kind of history of radiocarbon dating, and uh, I kind of expanded it to some kind of general overview of radiocarbon, and then I come back to the history at the end uh, in a kind of modern uh, look at it. And uh, I did this uh, thinking this would be a way to highlight the whole technique. Um, Obviously, I could spend the whole time talking about uh, some specific measurements. I already gave a talk earlier this week about tree rings, which is a kind of newer, well, it's an older and newer application of radiocarbon, and I may mention that briefly. So these are the outline of my presentation, uh, give you some idea about the history, about the development of AMS, and uh, going back to the ideas of radiocarbon dating, and then some specific examples. And actually, at the end, we come back to the beginning, which I will show you. Uh, so this is for the non-specialists in the audience. So carbon-14 is about one part in 10 to the 12 of modern carbon. And it has a half-life of 5,700 years, more or less. And it decays by beta decay to nitrogen-14. So it's actually produced from nitrogen-14 and decays to nitrogen-14, which is kind of uh, strange. But in any case, we also have, we also refer to this as radiocarbon frequently, and uh, we obviously have a journal called radiocarbon, which I'll also mention briefly at the end. So I showed this picture earlier in a different talk. Uh, the carbon-14 is produced by secondary neutrons, thermal neutrons in the upper atmosphere, which are coming from primary cosmic ray interactions with the atmosphere. Obviously, there are all kinds of other nuclei that are also produced in similar processes, but carbon-14 is unique in that the cross-section to make carbon-14 is, is very high, and is about two bonds, and the C14 also has a chemistry where it's rapidly incorporated into CO and then into CO2, so it moves into the atmosphere very fast, and uh, since we have uh, a biosphere, which is in equilibrium with the atmosphere, so plants are absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere and making uh, sugars and cellulose. Uh, we see this all around here on this beautiful campus. And then animals eat the plants and so on. And uh, as long as you are in equilibrium with this system, you have uh, some constant level of carbon-14, which at the moment is about uh, one point something times 10 to the minus 12 in C14 to 12 ratio. But if you're removed from this system, that is, you die, then this equilibrium level will decay. So uh, 
This is a little bit different than some other radioactive nuclide processes where you have a radioactive equilibrium. This is basically a kind of quasi-equilibrium, which is the uh, base level, and then C14 decays from this level. One of the other problems is that the carbon-14 production rate in the atmosphere is not constant. It varies with time, and so we have to worry a little bit about that when we calculate uh, true ages as opposed to radiocarbon ages. So, um, so this is our <coughs> brief uh, introduction. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we measure C14 and then come back to some of the principles involved. So in the beginning, uh, there was a, a guy called Bill William Willard Libby who had worked on the Manhattan Project. And after the, in 1946, he wrote a paper where he estimated that you could actually produce enough carbon-14 in the atmosphere that it should be measurable and that it could be used as a dating technique. And, uh, and then we developed to various other methods later, which I'll come back to. And prior to this, uh, sometime before the Second World War, uh, this uh, gentleman, Franz Curry, had actually proposed the existence of carbon-14, which was confirmed sometime around this time in the 1930s. And uh, C14 was unusual because it has a much longer half-life than it's expected to have, which is a whole other talk. Uh, but it was a, since the half-life was about five or 6,000 years, clearly, if it could be used for dating, it would be useful to date events on a human time scale. So that was, in fact, what uh, Libby uh, proposed. And uh, this is with Libby's original paper, which is public in physical review. And I understand that the first one or two versions of this paper were rejected because uh, the reviewers didn't think it was uh, reasonable, so nothing much has changed there. But uh, in any case, this paper proposed that both uh, uh, C14 and also he was interested in helium could be produced by cosmic radiation and therefore could be used as a dating tool. Uh, so uh, he went on from there to develop a method to do this dating, which involved converting CO2 to basically graphite, actually black carbon, so or some sort of amorphous carbon, which he coated on the outside of a counter. This is his colleague, uh, Fred Anderson, uh, holding the counter. And uh, I showed this picture also before. So this is Libby, of course, he's the professor. He's wearing a tie and smoking a pipe, and the postdoc and the graduate student have to sit in the basement to make the C14 measurements. Uh, so this also here, not much has changed. Right? So, and, and this was a kind of an interesting method because you can see here they have an oscilloscope and they have this counter to, uh, thing here somewhere and they have a lot of batteries. And this uh, picture is taken in the basement in the heating tunnel of a building in the University of Chicago. I think it's the economics building. It still exists actually. And uh, you can see it was uh, hard work. Um, but in any case, they were successful and they published a paper. This is the first paper uh, published by Arnold and Libby in uh, 1949, I believe. This is science. So in 1949, you could make a few radiocarbon dates and publish them in science. And uh, nowadays, if you try to do that, the science would reject it immediately. Uh, and uh, is it measurement from the graphite? It's measured by counting uh, this amorphous carbon that was on the, outs on, the, on the walls of this counter. So they, they counted the beta decays from the graphite. And where do you take the graphite from? They produce the graphite from CO2 by reacting it with magnesium. From the no, 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 the CO2, they, they collected the CO2 from uh, uh, biogas, basically from the sewers, and from uh, dead uh, petroleum gas. Those are the two original samples. And they reacted the CO2 with magnesium to make amorphous carbon. Uh, 
that's an interesting thing because some of the early AMS people tried to do this too. But anyway, so they uh, measured a few known age samples, which I'll come back to in a moment. So it may be hard to read here. But the first sample they measured was uh, some wood from the tomb of uh, the Pharaoh Josa. So he was a, I think, a early kingdom a pharaoh in Egypt, and this sample had an age which was already known to be about uh, 4000 BC, because archaeologists uh, told uh, Arnold and Libby and his colleagues that, you know, the archaeologists uh, found the wood in the pharaoh's tomb, and they already had a list of all the pharaohs, and they knew exactly how long they reigned, and so therefore they should know the age precisely of the pharaoh. So. I'll come back to this sample later because we redated this uh, recently. They also found some other samples. Uh, some were tree rings, uh, which they got for actually from the University of Arizona. And um, so we also tracked down some of these samples recently. And they also found some other objects that they had got from archaeologists where the archaeologists assured them that they knew the age of the sample. And one of the interesting uh, quarks of radiocarbon dating is, is the half-life that's used in radiocarbon age calculations is actually 5568 instead of 5730. And uh, this was a development from Libby's original work. Uh, Libby originally used the, uh, what is actually the correct half-life, and then some more measurements of the half-life were done, and they changed the value of the half-life to an incorrect value which was never, which historically remains in effect for radiocarbon age calculations. And when we actually calibrate ages against known age material, which I'll come to a little bit later, we correct for this strange anomaly. And uh, for some reason, the radiocarbon community has never changed this number. Uh, there was a meeting in 1982 in Seattle which was about the beginning of AMS when they could have changed this, this value to the correct half-life uh, because all the AMS people are counting atoms instead of decays. It would have been the opportune time to change it, but they didn't do that. Uh, so that's a kind of a strange thing. So, so this is a plot, this is a much clearer uh, table from the previous paper. It's the same table. And uh, Libby and Arnold plotted these samples against known age. So this is a wood from two different pharaoh's temples in Egypt. This is another pharaoh. This is a redwood. It's actually sequoia from California. These were tree rings. And uh, these are some Roman samples. And there's another sample labeled tree ring, which I'm going to come back to later. And you'll notice that most of these points plot more or less on an exponential decay curve with a half-life of 5,700 years. So Libby thought uh, this is a gold mine and this is the start of, of radiocarbon dating. And uh, this is a little bit later plot published in uh, 1956. By this time, Libby is a world-famous uh, radiocarbon expert and is writing papers for Scientific American and National Geographic and so on. In this plot, there's a little bit more samples. And you can see that some of the samples don't plot on the line. And in this case, they used a slightly different, the, uh, the, the half-life that's currently used, which is 5568 for radiocarbon measurements. And you start to see that everything is not as simple as you think. It's not just an exponential decay. There is some other effects because the zero age value of C14, you know, it's not decaying from a constant value. We know that this original value, the production value, varies with time. So therefore, you have to be able to correct for that. And the way to correct for that is to have material of known age to do your calibration. So in, in, a, in some sense, this is the first uh, calibration curve, if you like, and we'll see many more in a moment. So 
The basic idea is you can calculate the radiocarbon age, which we still refer to as the radiocarbon age, which is just calculated from the exponential decay of the C14 from whatever we think zero is, and with a half-life of 55, 68 years. So hopefully everybody in the room already can do this, so I don't have to explain it. And because we know that the zero value, the value we started with, varies with time, this introduces a much more complicated situation than just this simple uh, radioactive decay equation, which uh, I assume everybody knows. So things went along for a while, and Libby got the Nobel Prize. And uh, of course, uh, as you already figured out, uh, Libby was sitting in the office with the suit and tie on, and other guys were doing the work, but this is how it works when you get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Since I don't have one, I don't know. <laughs> uh, any case, uh, this was a very famous thing, and radiocarbon became this method that everybody knows about. And in fact, you know, I talk to people, you can meet people in the street and tell them that you work on radiocarbon dating, and they have some idea of what that means. And they may have even read about uh, the Shroud of Turin or something like that. And if you told them that you're an astrophysicist, they'll you know, walk away quickly. So, uh, in any case, uh, I come back to the design that Libby used. He built this anti-coincidence uh, chamber, with, and the central chamber was quote, coated with this amorphous carbon, or you can call it graphite, but it's not really graphite. And uh, then he was able to put this stuff in the basement of the building in Chicago and count the C14 and screen out the other counts that are coming from cosmic rays by having an anti-coincident system. And this system is still used for gas counting today. Um, so the idea was basically the same. This is actually a drawing from Libby's thesis in uh, the 30s from Berkeley where he already had this idea. So uh, this is a better picture of it. One of the problems was that in the 1950s, uh, nuclear testing in the atmosphere was occurring, and this made this technique impossible. So he would count the decays of C14, which has a decay rate of, if it's a modern sample, maybe 13 decays per minute per gram of carbon, so it's quite a relatively low count rate. And at the time of atmospheric nuclear testing, there was a lot of fallout and short-lived nuclides running it fall uh, around, and uh, this system became completely useless. So they had to move to gas counting after that time where they could uh, produce either CO2 or methane or acetylene. Those were the three gases that were used for counting using a gas, and they could avoid the problem of the nuclear fallout uh, background. Uh, so, so things moved to gas counting, also to liquid scintillation counting, and this went on from the 50s until the 1970s when uh, people started to think about much the, one of the limitations of the gas counting was that you needed grams of carbon, and uh, there was a move to find small ways to measure smaller and smaller samples. And the first idea to actually do this with a, with a paper, this is actually a patent by uh, Michael Anbar. He was from, uh, I think, Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, in 1974, where he proposed this novel idea of mixing CO2 with nitrogen-15, and then having a mass spectrometer that measured masses 27, 28, and 29, which would be C12, 13, and 14, with uh, a nitrogen attached, so this is like CN minus, and using a negative ion mass spectrometer. <coughs> this uh, method never really worked, and in fact, nobody really talks about it anymore, uh, although recently there's been some discussion of similar ideas. Um, so Anbar actually wrote a patent on this idea, which has expired, uh, but he never pursued it very far. But at the same time, people, were started, people in the accelerator community were already familiar with negative ions uh, 
and uh, latched onto this idea. So since about 1978, the increasing number of radiocarbon measurements are made by accelerator mass spectrometry. Now it's the vast majority, and the counter labs are measuring a few hundred samples a year here and there. So uh, there were two papers published in 1977 which summarized uh, two different approaches which were used, one in McMaster University in, in uh, Hamilton in Canada and also in the University of Toronto. One of the most interesting things about this is that these two groups are uh, 60 kilometers apart and they didn't talk to each other. And they both submitted papers to science at the same time, which are published in the same issue of science uh, back to back. Uh, so uh, there was another idea to use cyclotrons for um, C14 measurements, uh, which was pursued by uh, Rich Mueller at, uh, in Berkeley, which also had some success. But again, one of the problems was if you want to do C14 dating, you have to be able to normalize the C14 to the stable isotope so you have some idea of how much C14 is in your sample. And with a cyclotron, that would be a little trickier. So where are we today? I need a little water. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, 3 million volt uh, NEC machine in Arizona. And now this is a large machine. I mean, uh, there are many much smaller machines for radiocarbon, but this machine is installed in the year 2000, and in the year 2000 we were still using relatively large accelerators for carbon-14 measurements. Uh, obviously at Lima you have a 1 million volt uh, high voltage machine, which is much smaller than this machine, but the principle is basically always the same. Uh, so. I'll come back to the principle in a minute. So, so basically, the the size of samples has been getting the size of machines has been getting smaller since, in I think 1996, there was an AMS conference in Tucson where uh, the first proposed smaller machine was uh, talked about. And so now we have machines which are going down to this size. This is the one in in Hungary, which is a 200 kilovolt. A compact uh, machine which only does carbon-14. And so this machine is about the size of a, a stable isotope mass spectrometer and, um, and can do C14 measurements as well as a much larger machine. And this is uh, my colleague Mishi Mona. Uh, and for scale, this is the same, relatively same size person in <laughs> for scale. Um, <clears throat> so in, in AMS, we extract negative ions, we pass them through an accelerator, so we accelerate the ions. We always strip some charge off the ions in, in the terminal of the accelerator, and then we end up with positive ions. And so we basically do mass spectrometry to separate the C14 from everything else, and uh, this works very well. So as I mentioned before, in the 1950s, in the early 60s, there's a lot of nuclear testing. So besides the source of C14 from cosmic radiation, or secondary <coughs> cosmic radiation, we added C14 to the atmosphere from nuclear testing, which eventually doubled the C14 in the atmosphere. This signal has been declining uh, since then and is now basically in equilibrium with the ocean. So it's almost back to being one. And in fact, because we're adding dead carbon to the atmosphere all the time, this uh, value in the atmosphere is going to continue to decline to a point where it's actually below the original pre-bomb pre value. And uh, I showed this picture before. Uh, basically, because of the bomb testing, we were able to understand a little bit about the circulation of C14 in the atmosphere. And so we can define different zones for slightly different levels of C14, at least for a bomb carbon-14. So uh, what does this look like in a natural machine? Uh, this is the output of a C14 signal from the Arizona machine. And uh, so this is uh, the C14 peak. And you can see that basically 
the AMS is a very big mass spectrometer. It separates carbon-14 from everything else. We have the very lucky uh, fact that nitrogen-14 doesn't make a stable negative ion, otherwise this would never work. And there's not much else here. There's some odd ions which are outside the window. And, but this is a very clean signal. And so carbon-14 and some other isotopes such as uh, aluminum-26 and ID-129 can be measured by AMS with basically no isobaric interferences. Other nuclides such as beryllium-10, which has a longer half-life, has an isobar of boron-10, and then you have to worry much more about removing the isobaric interferences. So what can you do with AMS? You can measure all kinds of samples. Um, these are some wood samples which are being uh, cleaned in the lab, and uh, the standard uh, pretreatment is called the acid-base acid treatment, which all radiocarbon people know what that means. And uh, so we treat the sample with acid to remove carbonates, which might be in the environment. We then treat the sample with a base, uh, a weak base solution, usually sodium hydroxide. And this changes the color of the solution to a dark brown, which is a soluble organic material. And then we reacidify the sample to remove uh, any remaining base which is left behind because the sodium hydroxide would absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. And this is the simplest protocol. There are many, many more complicated processes for cleaning bone samples, for cleaning textiles, where we do uh, organic uh, solvent extractions and uh, other different kinds of processes. So depending on the sample, you can change the chemistry. Uh, so I won't really go into the chemistry anymore, but that's a whole other subject, and I think Lema has a book about uh, all the different processes that can be used. So uh, I guess it's still available somewhere. <laughs> so um, I mentioned before that the production rate of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is not constant, and this means that you cannot just use a simple radioactive decay equation from a constant initial value to calculate your age, you have to worry about the fact that the N0 is not always the same. And the way that you do that is to take material where we know the age, that is T, so then we can calculate N0 by how much C14 is left in a sample of age T. So that's using the same equation backwards. And we know that over time there are fluctuations in the C14 signal, and there have been various efforts to produce uh, calibration curves, mostly based on tree rings, but also extending to other um, proxies for age, usually uranium thorium dating. Uh, and we, we now have a calibration curve that exists for basically the last 50,000 years, which is based on increments of about 10-year segments. We now know also, which was the topic of my other talk, that 10 years is not sufficient precision. We now really need to look at samples on an annual basis because we know that uh, there can be changes in the cosmic ray production rate of as much as a percent which occur on a very short time scale. That's a whole other talk about basically astrophysics. but. Uh, that makes this uh, calculation a little bit more complicated. However, there are online software programs where, which already incorporate all these data, and you can plug in your radiocarbon age, and it, it will kick out the calibrated age range, and you can obviously vary the assumptions or the boundary conditions for your calculation. In, in the southern hemisphere, I already showed you a plot that showed that the Earth was not a totally uniform uh, sphere for carbon-14. The southern hemisphere, C14 level, is slightly lower than the northern hemisphere because of the atmospheric circulation. And so uh, there's now an effort to also have a, a kind of southern hemisphere uh, calibration curve. And in the intermediate zone, so which Mexico would fall in the intermediate zone, 
you have to be a little bit careful about which, which zone you define your sample as being in. Uh, so this is a plot of uh, radiocarbon. This is given in terms of delta carbon-14, which is deviation in parts per thousand from what N0 should have been. Uh, so that's just an estimate of the deviation. And you can see that the difference between the northern and the southern hemisphere can be as much as five or six per mil, which translate to uh, an age difference of 30 or 40 years. So if you're trying to do very precise measurements, this becomes an important uh, question. So what can you date with these, this uh, technique? Obviously, many people know that you can date almost anything that contains organic material with uh, carbon-14, so, so we highlight a local product, is the Maya Codex, which has an age of something like, uh, I think, 900 years uh, radiocarbon age, which translates to something like the 13th century. Uh, this is a silk from India. This is a fresco. This sample is, uh, I think, 16th century. This is a fresco from a European church, which is, uh, I think 10th century, and this is the bust of Nefertiti, which is in Berlin. And we dated a sample of beeswax from the eye. I have to point out that the eye, there was only one eye there, the other one was already missing. So, and this is about 3,000 years old. So the radiocarbon dating is well known to be one of the best methods of estimating the age of any material which has an organic origin or various kinds of uh, carbonates, biogenic carbonates. So there are some problems with this because radiocarbon dating has become very useful also for commercial reasons. Um, so if you have a priceless artwork, you basically can't sell it on the market if you don't have a radiocarbon age. And so there are actually a number of uh, radiocarbon uh, labs that are basically commercial operations, and they do this kind of work all the time, although they don't like dating artworks in general. So there are two pictures here. Uh, both of these are supposed to be uh, Han Dynasty figures from China, which means about 2,000 years old. And uh, usually I ask somebody to tell me which one is the fake. But I can tell you that in this case, this one is the fake, even though it looks very old. And the problem is that uh, there's an industry of people making fake uh, objects like this and trying to sell them on the market as the real thing. And um, so for the radiocarbon lab, this is actually a little bit dangerous because you know, a lot of money is involved, and um, when you tell somebody that their priceless artwork is actually 50 years old, they're not happy. Also, they don't want to pay. So, uh, F.A. Morris already mentioned uh, that uh, we dated uh, the, what I would say is the most famous sample ever dated by radiocarbon, which is the, called the Shroud of Turin, which is supposed to be the burial cloth of Christ, and this was dated in 1988, so this is about the near the beginning of the real increase in AMS measurements, as Ephraim already mentioned, and this dates to the 14th century. It's, uh, it has a characteristic uh, twill pattern, the, the weave, which is a two-to-one herringbone weave, which is uh, well known since it's used in genes. And so, uh, and uh, this sample was dated by three labs, Arizona, Zurich, and Oxford. We published a paper in Nature. Subsequent to that, some other people dated various samples of the material which they didn't publish, but they all have the same age. And uh, every springtime, this object again becomes controversial about the time of Lent. Uh, the TV programs about the shroud, and there are many, many people and many thousands of internet websites that will tell you that this date is wrong. Uh, 
and uh, they have all kinds of explanations as to why the radiocarbon date might be wrong, but none of them are scientific. At least, that's my opinion. And uh, I actually had an email from some guy yesterday who wants to meet me to convince me to predate the sample. So it's still going on. Uh, so having done that under our belt, we decided to move to more uh, other kinds of interesting old objects. This is a, a scroll, which is in the, the shrine of the book in Jerusalem. This is a complete uh, scroll of the book of Isaiah, and it dates to about 150 BC. And so this is made on parchment, and uh, if, if you ask a, a rabbi, he can actually read this because it, uh, ancient Hebrew is still readable uh, today. So, um, so these objects weren't controversial because the age of the object turned out to be the age that everybody assumed they were. And uh, so, you know, there are no newspaper articles uh, about, there's no scandal, I guess. So uh, they just said, oh, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are 2,000 years old, and we already knew that. But they are very interesting objects, so I have a few slides about them. They were originally recovered from caves in the Dead Sea region, uh, east of Jerusalem, so actually not in Israel. And. Uh, since then, many more have been found, and some of them, most of them are in the museums in Israel. There are a few in museums in Jordan, and I think there were a few scrolls in, in Cairo. Uh, in any case, uh, almost all of them are 2,000 years old. They were, um, most of the original ones were religious texts, but there are also other kinds of texts which are um, sort of business documents, uh, invoices, very boring business documents, and also there are uh, just copies of books of the Bible, which are in Hebrew the same as today. And uh, then there are kind of religious commentaries, which are very extreme. So these religious commentaries, which attract a lot of attention, uh, were the writings of this religious group, which uh, I guess today you would call them some sort of terrorist organization, but in any case, they had some sort of very extreme view of the Bible, which wasn't the view of the conventional people in Jerusalem. So these people lived in the desert. They didn't agree with the people in Jerusalem. And uh, I, I met some uh, rabbi once who wanted me to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he, he, he had some other interpretation, which was kind of interesting, but which I won't go into here. In any case, the original ones were found in 1947, uh, which is described as being by some shepherd boys tending their flock. It sounds a very nice story. Uh, and these are the two gentlemen who found the scrolls, so you can, you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> and uh, they, so they found these scrolls, and they hid them somewhere for a while because they didn't know what to do with them. They knew that they were valuable. They were written in some strange language that they didn't understand because they were Arabs. And eventually they went to this guy who was an art dealer in Bethlehem. So he accepted them. And he eventually also couldn't sell them. So uh, he went to see his friend, who is this gentleman, who is the, the Syrian Orthodox Archbishop of Jerusalem. His name was Samuel. And so Samuel recognized these things were very valuable in a religious sense, and so he took them over, and he kept them in his church for some time. Uh, but as happens to many um, institutions, uh, the Metropolitan Samuel ran out of money, and so he decided to go as you would do. He went on an educational tour of the United States to raise money for his church in the 1950s. And uh, he also brought the scrolls with him, and they had exhibitions of the scrolls in various museums. And eventually, uh, they put them up for sale by advertising in the Wall Street Journal. This is the advertisement for Dead Sea Scrolls, ideal gift for an educational or religious institution. So this is, sounds great. Um, unfortunately for the Metropolitan Samuel, 
he really didn't want to sell them to the Israelis because he didn't like the Israelis for many reasons, which we all know. But the people who actually bought these scrolls were working for the Israelis, and the scrolls ended up in the shrine of the book in Jerusalem, so they built a new museum for these scrolls, and that's where they are today. This is the shrine of the book. And uh, many older scrolls are in this other museum, which is in East Jerusalem, which uh, is now controlled by Israelis anyway. And so there are ma many of these documents are actually in this museum. The more co complete scrolls are in uh, the uh, shrine of the book. So this is a, a huge resource in, in this uh, religious scholarship. So going back to dating, what can we learn from this? Uh, we measured this sample, a sample of this scroll taken from the top somewhere in uh, Arizona. This is the radiocarbon age, 2140 BC, BP. So this means calibrated age about 150 BC. And uh, in Zurich, they also measured a similar sample and got exactly <coughs> the same result. And so if you calibrate the age, you get a, a slightly wider range for the the true age because the calibration curve has some wiggles in it. And if you ask somebody who can identify the time period by the style of the writing, then they would put it at about 150 BC. So these values all agree. And so uh, this was a nice story. I have a few other stories, and then I'll go back to Libby at the end. This is another. Uh, this is called the Vinland map, and uh, this used to be a controversial object, now it's rather boring, uh, but this was found in the 1920s and was in the Yale University Library. Uh, I'm not quite sure how it got in the Yale University Library, but it was made on parchment, uh, and it showed uh, the New World over here, or at least a very small part of it. This is Newfoundland and Greenland, and uh, this scroll was thought to be old, and it was thought that, uh, so this showed that the Vikings knew about the New World before Columbus. Of course, we now know that this is all true because we, we know that there are archeological sites in Newfoundland of Viking settlements, so we know that Europeans came to the New World much earlier than Columbus, so Columbus is out of luck, I guess. Uh, so this uh, object turned out to have a radiocarbon age of about 450 years, which calibrates to be 1450 BC, uh, AD, I'm sorry, which is before Columbus. So anyway, in 1920, this was a big deal, but in, this was dated in 1990s. Of course, by then we already know about other archeological evidence, so it's not so important, but it was important to the, to the Yale University Library. And I have two other examples of controversial objects. So this is advice to Lema to be careful about what you date. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, pot, a papyrus, which was part of a codex. So a codex is just a book like the Maya Codex. And um, this codex had a, a, a number of uh, basically apocryphal gospel stories. Uh, and uh, if you know anything about the history of the early church, you know that in 325 AD, there was a council called the Council of Nicaea. And at that time, they basically decided to uh, regularize the teachings of the church and remove documents that didn't agree with the official line. That's the one way of putting it. And so there were other stories about the time of Christ which uh, were different, and um, they were removed from the official uh, Bible. Uh, many of these ideas still exist, but most of them were destroyed in the early fourth century. And this is one of them. It's called the Gospel of Judas. There's a long uh, National Geographic uh, video about this thing. And uh, in 2004, I was asked to join this small team to date this object. And uh, it was quite interesting because 
I was told to go to a hotel in Geneva and meet these people, like, you know, cloak and dagger sort of stuff. And then they drove to this office of this lady who had this parchment. It's actually a papyrus. And some of the codex, I guess, is still missing. And this codex had a rather strange history. It had been in Egypt and somehow ended up in the United States. And uh, now some Swiss art, art collector had about a third of it. The rest of it, we don't know where it is. And of course, the Egyptians still uh, want it back. But anyway, uh, so this again, this dates to about the second or third century AD. So we think this is a pre-Nicaea document. I have one more quick thing, and then I will go back to, the, to Libby to finish up. Uh, so this is another document which is in the Yale University Library, and I really don't know why the Yale University Library has all these esoteric documents, but I guess they collect them. Um, and this is called the Voynich Manuscript. This is a Polish immigrant to the U.S. called Voynich, and he bought this document to the United States in about 1912, and I think his widow gave it to the Yale University Library. Uh, this document, it's also a book, and it has strange drawings in it, like this one, and it's written in a language that nobody can decipher. If you go on the internet and put in this manuscript, you'll find hundreds of thousands of web pages of people who are trying to decipher this document. The uh, NSA and the CIA and so on have all tried to decipher this document, and nobody has succeeded. And uh, the writing looks like this. You can see that these are kind of astronomical drawings, and these are kind of botanical drawings, and these are some kind of drawings about uh, sort of personal cleanliness or something like that. But you can see that the writing looks vaguely like some Scandinavian language, but it's, uh, it's completely undecipherable. And so most people believe this is some kind of code but unfortunately, the code has been lost, so nobody knows how to read it. Uh, so anyway, this also dates to the 1400s, which is, um, I guess, there are a lot of strange things going on at that time. So the question is, why did somebody write this with all these interesting details about very different topics? Why did they write it in this uh, indecipherable language? And uh, did they do that? Uh, to protest something, or did they do that for some other strange reason? So let's get back to radiocarbon dating in general. We know there's a, there's a really nice paper by Ramsey et al. where they, um, they took samples from all the known tombs of Egyptian pharaohs, which as I mentioned, uh, are well dated by the archeologists. And they were able to show that all the radiocarbon dates for the Middle and the New Kingdom agree basically with, uh, with what the archaeologists told them. Whereas for the Old Kingdom, which is before about 2300 BC, this is not as well the case. So something happened here. Maybe some part of the chronology is lost. Uh, we don't know. And uh, I'll skip this one. So. Uh, I want to go back just to the end for a few minutes to talk about uh, Libby's original samples, since I mentioned that we redated them. Uh, so this is a kind of transitional uh, picture. So, so when, uh, at the beginning of this talk, we talked about the original samples that were dated by um, Libby and Arnold and Anderson. And it turned out that we were able, some kind of fortuitous reason, to acquire most of these samples. It turned out, first of all, that some of the samples were in the, the treating lab at the University of Arizona. I mean, they were literally on the wall as display items. You know, this is the original piece dated by Libby. There were a number of samples at UCLA, and we also had some contact with James Arnold's family, and uh, when he died, he turned out that he had stashed all these samples in the closet. So, um, okay, I did this too, like I have samples sitting in my office that have been there for a long time, and probably when somebody comes in my office, uh, 
they'll never figure out what they are. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it turned out that Arnold had kept a number of these samples sort of personally uh, oh, for the last uh, 50, 60 years. So anyway, so this is the original paper again. So we don't need to go talk about that. So we decided to redate a number of these samples just to see if Libby was right. So this is kind of just a sideline, right? So this is a picture of the Temple of Jose in Egypt. This is a pyramid, and this is one of the oldest uh, extant pyramids in Egypt. It's dating to like 4000 BC, 4500 BC. Uh, and so we, we have some wood, which is acacia, from this inside the pyramid. And we decided to redate the sample. We did the, the sample redating at several different labs, actually four different labs. And these are the original measurements made by, by Libby. The, the first one is uh, 46, eight. this is in radiocarbon years. I won't worry about calibrated age right now. But this is just to show you that all these labs get exactly the same result. So this, these samples, this sample, uh, there were several pieces of wood, so actually these are a tree ring with where there's 20 years between the two trees. The sample was redated in Arizona, Irvine, Zurich, and Debrecen, which is in Hungary. And you can see, first of all, all these, sam all these uh, labs agree within like one sigma. And secondly, that the result is very similar to the result that uh, given the errors that Libby got on this sample, which was the first sample ever measured for radiocarbon. I mean, literally the first sap real sample that Libby measured was this wood sample. And he labeled it uh, C1. Uh, so we can do some uh, calibration. Turns out to be like 4600 BC. So, I mean, sorry, 2600 BC, so 4600 years old which is what it's supposed to be. And we also decided to redate some of the other samples that Libby had. So these were two other wood samples from other pharaohs. These were dated only at Irvine. Again, the agreement's very good. And uh, we then found the other samples, which were in the treating lab at the University of Arizona, as I said, hiding in plain sight, actually, because they were literally on the wall. And so we resampled these, uh, these trees. Uh, this is Charlotte Pearson and uh, Chris Bazan doing the sampling. And this is the, another of the samples, which as I mentioned was a display item on the wall. This is the new sample that we removed. And so then, and this is the, another one, which is a sequoia. This is called Redwood by Libby. And so we again did the redating, and we found one sample where the result was different from uh, Libby by quite a bit. It was actually uh, younger. And another one, the centennial stump, which turned out to be basically the same age, 1200 BC, of, that Libby had obtained. So if we, and we found some other stuff that uh, is, he doesn't report immediately. Uh, so we then, decided to put our new data on Libby's old plot. So this is getting to the end of the talk. And we found that this sample, which was too high before, actually plots down here on the line. And the Joza, the original first sample, plots a little bit higher, but more or less where Libby shows it to be in some of his plots. So the, 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 the conclusion of the story is basically that Libby was right his measurements were incredibly accurate. And if we take the same samples of Libby today, we get the same results, which is amazing given that it involves three or four generations of technology and a totally different way of measuring the sample by counting the atoms instead of just uh, counting the beta decays. So just to summarize the final two slides, you know, now we, we see people talking about newer technologies for radiocarbon. These are still under development. I don't, I don't know how far they will go. The first one is called, uh, the, there is a laser method, which is a cavity ring down method, which has some promise. And there's another one which involves using positive ions injected into an AMS machine, which um, 
hasn't really worked very well so far, although they got down to something like 10% modern carbon. And so I guess when somebody gives this talk again in, in a few years, we may have other technologies to add to AMS. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much. very much for uh, this uh, review of the historical development of uh, this uh, carbon-14 dating technique. Uh, we have time for questions and comments. What is the current is the current uncertainty in the half-life of carbon-14? Okay, so that, that's a very good question. It's about, I think, 20 years. 20. The, so the, most people are using this half-life at 57, 30, plus or minus 30, so that, you know, in the calibration, that the error in the half-life doesn't really matter because we have the, the levels of C14 at known ages in the past. So the, you know, we have a independent calibration. So the half-life error is not important. If you look in the table of the nuclides, the value that's given there is 5,700. I think plus or minus 20. And I don't think anybody has measured this half-life recently. So it obviously could be improved. Thank you, Tim, for this wonderful talk. I want to ask you, um, we can consider then that the very first uh, calibration curve was the one that the Levy did? I we can consider can that, that as way, a... Yes, yeah. I mean, he didn't uh, think of it that way, but that's the case, yeah. And, you know, now the calibration is, um, is changing because uh, people are measuring annual data in tree rings, and, and most of the calibration curve I showed you was based on 10 to 20 year increments. And since we know there were these rapid fluctuations in C14, uh, the annual record is very important. So I, this calibration process is still evolving. And uh, one of the problems with the calibration curve, which I didn't mention, is that there was a tendency over the last decade to smooth the calibration curve uh, this was basically to make archaeologists happy because it made the apparent errors smaller, where in, as in fact the underlying data is more noisy than we previously thought, so perhaps uh, that was a mistake. So we need to go back to reevaluating the, the annual data. And it will take a long time to collect all this data to make a calibration curve over, say, 12,000 years. It's 12,000 radiocarbon dates. That's a lot of measurements. <laughs> and uh, as we talked about, also, you can't do this in one lab because one lab might have some, some systematic bias. You need two or three labs to independently confirm these results, which have very high precision. All right. Thank you very much for a very illuminated talk. Uh, can you comment something uh, about uh, possible forensic applications of the AMS technique? Yes. Uh, so forensic applications, uh, yes. Uh, some people have used radiocarbon for forensic applications. Uh, they, they have looked at teeth and bones and tissue uh, from obviously dead people. And uh, they you can show that you can understand the, the, for example, the growth of teeth. We know more or less about uh, when different teeth grow in. So if you can date the tooth and, and, and then compare it to, uh, say, tissue from the same uh, person, you can actually calculate the, estimate the age of the person, not just the age of the sample, but the age of the person. So you need to be able to compare different tissues to do that. But uh, since we know the residence time of carbon in say teeth and bones and tissue is different, it's possible some people have tried to do that. Uh, and uh, there are some cases where, for example, I know there were some cases in Vienna where so 
bodies were found in, in an apartment where somebody had been dead for a couple of years or just because nobody ever went and talked to them or something like that. So, and uh, so then they wanted to know how long the person had been dead. So then you could use the bomb spike to, to estimate this. And, and given, it depend, depending on the age of the person and, you know, because a, the, a person living for 60 years, the bones are integrating the C14 signal over some period of time over the bomb spike, whereas the tissue is, is within the last one or two years. The teeth are basically whenever the tooth grew in. So, so you can get a lot of information if you, if you study the systematics of, of the whole process. Yeah. I don't know. I can leave first. <laughs> Uh, my question is more related with machines. Uh, you speak about this reduction in energy and in the dimensions of the machines. You have these three megavolts, we have this one megavolt, and then exist Mikalas as in Brazil. Which is the main difference from the point of view of the measurement? There, are, there, is, there is some advantage from one of this uh, bigger energy or less energy? Um, I think at this point that there's no real advantage to the bigger machine for carbon-14. Uh, it might be that the bigger machine has a lower blank than a very small machine. Uh, the advantage of the very small machines is that you really don't have to know anything about accelerators to operate them. So, so they're being purchased by people, say, is like a black box. So this might be dangerous in the long term. Yeah. <laughs> so it may be a false uh, promise, but. Uh, at the moment, there are about, I think, 15 or 20 of these uh, Mikaidas machines, and, and there are people talking about going to even smaller machines, but I don't really know what advantage that would be. But the disadvantage is that you're using the one plus charge state, and then you can have molecular ions. So you have to be careful that the molecular ion is, is not in the detector when you're counting carbon-14. I just uh, missed something. and. Very nice talk, I thank you very much. Uh, you were saying that there were different techniques for getting the, the, the dating. And one was the counting the decays, but before they were counting the atoms. That's what I understood. No, first of all, they were counting the decays. Okay. So, so the first method of Libby used solid carbon, but he was counting the beta decays. And then they used a gas, and then there's also liquid scintillation, which makes uh, benzene. And then you add a, a, a photochemically active agent to count photons. And then since the late 70s, uh, the AMS obviously counting atoms directly. So, so there's this evolution of techniques. Uh, the counting of the beta particles obviously still works. You just need more sample. Uh, because you need like you know, 100 to 1,000 times more sample to get the same precision. You can use AMS on like uh, less than a milligram of carbon. Uh, for a modern sample, one milligram of carbon has uh, 30 million carbon-14 atoms in it. So if you go to very, very small samples, this could become a problem. When people talk about in microgram samples, then you have to really think about how many atoms are in the target. Anyway, that's a... I, I would like to... to, to to make a comment, uh, where, because you said that uh, there's not much change since the uh, Libby measurements to the ones that you just you just made, but uh, in the in the result in the but, but in the result there's one yes. important difference, and this is the error bar. Yeah, the error is the error of course bar much different. Goes down from yes. 600 to 20. Yes, uh, that, well, that, that's true. That's a huge difference. That, that's where the technology comes in, I guess, because yes. we now can count up to. A million carbon 14s, and uh, if you want, if you right. have enough uh, sample to do that, and uh, counting that enough statistics to, to to do this with beta decays, that would be. It would take a long, long time. <laughs> it could be done. You have to count for several weeks and have 10 grams of sample or something. Right. Like that. So you need the, you need the whole shroud, right? Yes, <laughs> or a large piece of it. Yeah. Uh, any, any more questions uh, for uh, uh, Professor Tim Jun? If not, then uh, thank you very much for, for your... Gracias. Uh,